The haunting cry of his wolves grows closer by the second. Turning your head around, you catch a glimpse of something behind you, much too large to be called a dog. A choice must be made. Keep running until the sun comes up, or face your pursuer head on. Welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up and revive monsters from the history of D&D for you to use in your world. This week's monster, or monsters I should say, is actually in the sourcebook as an event. In 3.5's Monster Manual 5, you will find a monster called the Wild Hunt. The Wild Hunt actually consists of five different monsters, the Master of the Hunt and his four Hounds of the Hunt. These creatures have been in every version of D&D to date, aside from 5th edition of course. However, like I said, I'll be basing my conversion off of the 3rd edition stat block, just because for my own reasons that's easier to convert than 4th edition or AD&D. So I figured it's been a while since we showcased a big boss monster on the channel, and it's been a while since we talked about Fae. So fortunately, the master of the hunt and his hounds are both. We're going to talk about just what exactly these creatures are, what they're capable of in both combat and out, some possible additions to what's already in the book, and of course some ways that you can use them in your game. To kick things off, let's talk about what the concept of the wild hunt actually is. Every year at a specific time, usually coinciding with the winter solstice or some other astral event, the master of the hunt emerges from the Feywild with his four hounds. He appears somewhat elf-like, except he's much larger in both build and height, standing over 10 feet tall. Each of his four hounds appears as a wolf, but almost the size of a bear, and they have many fey-like qualities. For example, they have a partially exposed skull and glowing eyes of different colors. The master of the hunt is an expert archer, and he lives for the thrill of tracking down his prey and defeating them. In addition to all that raw skill and natural talent, though, he has a few really interesting tricks up his sleeve. The master of the hunt truly excels at nighttime under a full moon. Whenever he looses an arrow from his bow, the second it leaves the hunter's grasp, it grows to the size of a spear. This not only causes massive damage, but it's also really intimidating, and if nothing else, it should at least tip your players off that what they're dealing with is not natural. Speaking of the moon, according to the book, the moon also functions as the eye of the wild hunt. What exactly does that mean? Well, it means that the master of the hunt can essentially scry on any creature anywhere in the material plane as long as it's outside under the moon. This is an incredibly useful ability to have when you're trying to track down a specific creature, as is often the case during the wild hunt. Once the master of the hunt has found its target, it can then try to ensure they don't get away by marking them with its selected prey ability. The target is essentially affected by a fairy fire spell, meaning that the master has advantage on all the attack rolls he makes against that target. The only real difference between the spell and this ability is that this ability lasts until the moon sets, meaning that any creature trying to survive the night is going to have a much tougher time. Once the chase begins, the master of the hunt can summon a ghostly steed. This ability functions identically to the spell Phantom Steed. If the chase happens to lead the party and the hunter out into an open area, this ability not only becomes extremely useful, but extremely terrifying. I do like the idea that in this situation, the party would kind of see him coming off in the distance and have at least a few rounds to prepare what they want to do. It just sets this ominous mood where you can just see your hunter approaching you. It's very intense. In addition to all his great tracking abilities, of course in combat, the master of the hunt is no pushover. He carries a massive black longbow that is enchanted with a seeking property. If a target is hiding, behind cover, behind half cover, or prone, anything like that that would normally cause disadvantage, because the arrow loosed from the bow goes to find its target, he does not roll with disadvantage. The only thing here is the master of the hunt has to know the creature is there. It can't just fire its bow randomly and have the arrows just go to their target. But as long as he knows generally the area they're standing in, even if they're invisible, he still doesn't get disadvantage on the attack roll. The master is also prepared to go up against almost any type of creature. On his back is strapped the Quiver of Ilana. This is a magical quiver that can hold up to 90 arrows of any type in an extra dimensional space. Inside, he normally keeps adamantine, silver, and cold iron arrows. Depending on who or what he is tracking though, you may decide he has different types of arrows that are more appropriate for the prey. Ultimately that's up to you, but the point here is that the master of the hunt will be prepared for almost anything. Speaking of which, if things get a little up close and personal, 
the master of the hunt can pull out his flaming halberd. This weapon is not likely to come out as the master of the hunt is more fond of displaying his expert marksmanship. However, it can prove to be just as deadly as his bow. In addition to the regular damage and the fire damage of the halberd, if the huntsman manages to score a critical hit, it also causes the target to burst into flames, dealing even more damage. It's not ideal for taking trophies, but it gets the job done. So, the master of the hunt sounds pretty awesome, right? But where would he be without his faithful hunting hounds? These beasts are much more than just regular hounds, however. Between Feywild magic and being trained to perfection, each one of these hounds possesses incredible strength and speed. They run ahead of their master, routing any prey that they've been instructed to track. When they get close to their target, they let loose a blood-curdling howl that not only alerts their master to the prey's presence, but also forces any creatures in the area to make a wisdom save. And if they fail, they suffer from the frightened condition. Just like the master, each one of these hounds can exceed their limitations under a full moon. They cause much more damage and have access to an exceptionally useful ability. One bite from a hound of the hunt is enough to anchor a creature's astral body meaning that it cannot teleport or plane shift anywhere for at least one round. This can create a really interesting situation for your players. If, for example, the first dog catches up to the party and bites the nearest player, what are they going to do? They may have been planning to just teleport away, but are they really going to leave one of their own to certain death? Even worse, if the party gets caught off guard and teleports away without realizing what's happened, they may end up leaving someone behind. Even if they then return to help that player, they've still wasted at least one round of actions, just who knows where, teleporting away, and whatever spellcaster was casting the spell has now wasted two spell slots just so they could leave and then come back. That said though, I don't think this is too punishing because if the players figure this out, and then are able to avoid getting hit by any of the dogs for just one round, they can then teleport away to safety as temporary as it might be. So let's talk about using this encounter in your game. The most obvious application, of course, would it just be having the master of the hunt hunt down your party. At the beginning of the wild hunt, the master of the hunt will always choose one exceptionally powerful creature to be its prey, someone who it feels is worthy to be hunted. If you have a member of your party who has recently won a great duel, or has done some sort of exceptional martial or magical feat, they very well could be chosen to be that prey. After that, the rest of this encounter pretty much writes itself, but I do have a few key points that I think are important to remember when you run this. First off, the master of the hunt doesn't want to just sneak up on the target and kill them. He wants the hunt, the thrill of the chase. In order for that to happen, the target sort of has to know what's being hunted. You could do this in a couple different ways. One way you could accomplish this is by having a lesser fae, something like a Bantray, which I've actually talked about in a previous video on this channel, just show up and hand the player a scroll. And then just as quickly as it appears, it vanishes back into the forest. The player opens up the scroll and inside there's simply a message that just says, you have been chosen, ready yourself for nightfall. If you really wanted to, you could have the letter say something less ominous and just outright explain the situation to the player. Either way, they'll be on guard that night. This is also a prime opportunity to give the players a cool handout. I'd recommend actually making a letter and wrapping it up and tying it with a piece of twine or something and giving it to them. Players love getting handouts like that, and it's just kind of cool. If they choose to investigate what this means, you could have them encounter an NPC or some other source of knowledge like a library or a diviner. This source of knowledge, whatever you choose it to be, will then inform them what the wild hunt is and what it entails. Another choice you have for setting up this kind of adventure would be to maybe have the chosen player appear with a brand on them somewhere that just shows up overnight. When they investigate what this brand is and ultimately discover the wild hunt and what that's all about, then they have the day to prepare for nightfall and await the huntsman's coming. As far as resolution goes here, obviously if the players manage to defeat the master of the hunt and his hounds, they've definitely won. However, if the party is a little bit lower level, or maybe not as well equipped to deal with the huntsman, just surviving the night could be a victory unto itself. I also kind of like the idea that the party is going to be rewarded by the master of the hunt if they somehow manage to succeed. If they actually manage to defeat him, or you just decide he yields, before dropping to 0 HP, he could say something to the players along the lines of, I have not been tested by a group of mortals such as this in ages, expressing gratitude to the players for giving him an exciting and thrilling hunt. Maybe as thanks, he grants them some sort of magical item or other important item that pertains to your world. The same could be true if they simply manage to just avoid the huntsman. While some might call this cowardly, 
To avoid the master of the hunt for an entire night is definitely a feat worthy of recognition. If you wanted to add more of an intense vibe to the hunt, perhaps the party stumbles upon a deserted island. On the island, there isn't much except for a lot of trees and maybe a small shrine near the center of the island. Only once night falls do the players realize that they've found themselves in the master's hunting grounds. Perhaps they're even led here by a creature such as the Bantray. No matter how they get there, once they're on the island, the only way they'll be allowed to leave is if they can survive the night or defeat the master of the hunt and his four hounds. Another variation on this narrative actually comes from the older source books of D&D. In AD&D, the wild hunt wasn't about hunting down a powerful creature for the sake of the hunt, it was about protecting his domain. Whenever a great evil would rise up in the lands protected by the master of the hunt, he would appear and hunt down this evil with the help of his hounds. In a story like this, you could actually have the players align themselves with the master of the hunt and help him take down whatever this evil force may be. Maybe he even comes to the players knowing they're powerful and asks them to assist him with this. Or you could spin it so that the players have to summon him. Maybe the evil rising up in the land is way beyond their pay grade and they're not actually that high level yet. But if they're able to reach the ancient temple of the Watcher in time and perform some sort of ritual, they can summon him before it's too late. Yet another way you could play out this encounter is to have the marked one be someone who's a friend to the party, just an NPC or even just an important NPC. Maybe this NPC actually contracts out the party to protect him during the night of the hunt. If the NPC they're protecting is a friend of the party, the focus kind of shifts to protecting this character at all costs. I could see this playing out very similarly to the first hook I mentioned, but it could add some extra tension knowing that there are going to be consequences beyond even PC death depending on who that NPC is. If that character is, say, part of an important prominent royal family in your world, who knows what could happen if that character dies. Another thing I want to mention here is that a chase sequence like this is a great opportunity to use a skill challenge. For those of you not familiar with the skill challenge or what that is, it's one of the hidden gems from 4th edition. Here's how it works. Basically, you start off by telling the players what the situation is. Here, you might say something like, The hounds are hot on your trail, howling as they close on their prey. Further behind them, between the trees, you can hear the echoing of hooves charging closer and closer by the second. Then, you have all the players roll initiative, and you go around the table in turn order, just like combat. The only difference here is that instead of casting a spell, moving, or attacking, the players all have to make a skill check on their turn. They can make any skill check they want, but they have to explain to you, the DM, how they're going to use that skill to help the party reach its goal, which in this case is escaping from the master of the hunt. Based on the result of their skill check, you decide whether that counts as a failure or a success. The goal here is to get five successes before you get three failures. If the party gets to five successes, then they win. If they get to three failures first, then they lose. So, to give an example of what that could look like in this situation, we'll say up first is our party's barbarian, Bango. On Bango's turn, he decides he wants to use his athletics check because that's what he's good at, he's a barbarian. So, Bango decides that he can use athletics to pull down a tree behind them and maybe block their path, giving them extra time to escape. That sounds fine, so Bango rolls and comes up with a 17. That's really good, so you explain to the party that Bango succeeds in ripping down this tree, blocking the path behind you, buying you a few precious seconds. Next up is Lore, the party ranger. He's good at navigating through forests, so he decides that he wants to roll survival to try to find a better path through the woods. Unfortunately, he rolls really poorly and it comes up as a 6 total. Then you explain to the party that unfortunately, Lore was not able to find a better path. Just with all the commotion and the hounds snapping at your heels, he couldn't find a safer way through the woods. You continue on like this until they've either had 3 failures or 5 successes. If they fail, then the hounds catch up to them and combat begins. If they succeed, maybe they've managed to shake the master of the hunt for an hour, which has bought them enough time to take a short rest before the hunt continues. More importantly, it's gotten them one hour closer to sunrise. The number of successes or failures it takes to win or lose a skill challenge is not necessarily set in stone, but just from my experience, 3 and 5 has worked pretty well, at least as a starting point. By running the escape this way, or at least a section of the escape this way, it gives the players a good opportunity to roleplay and kind of think outside the box a little bit. Plus, it's a lot more fun and exciting than trying to math out everyone's movement speed and they actually will have a chance to get away with something that otherwise would overtake them just in stats alone. 
The key to making a skill challenge fun is just getting really creative with the narration. Because ultimately the party knows they need 3 failures or 5 successes. So you can pretty much say and or do whatever you want as long as it fits within the realm of possibility. It's basically like narrating a really awesome scene from an action movie. Another useful tool you could use is tracking their pursuit level. Now for anyone who's run or played in Out of the Abyss, you probably know exactly what I mean, but for those who haven't, this is kind of how it works. There's a table in the Out of the Abyss adventure that has rules for when the party's being pursued by someone. Essentially, the party has a set pursuit level. Every time they do something favorable to stave off pursuit, such as crossing a body of water or getting to the other side of a rope bridge and then cutting it so no one can follow them, their pursuit level goes down. Every time they do something that makes them easier to track, such as cutting their way through dense foliage or making camp somewhere, their pursuit level goes up. When the pursuit level reaches a certain point, the hunter catches up to them and combat begins. This can be a pretty great way just as a DM of deciding when and where the hunter should show up, and it also gives your players a quantifiable way to avoid him entirely. If that sounds like something you'd like to use, definitely check out the Out of the Abyss adventure book because it has the full table there as well as lots of great advice on how to use it. The very last thing I want to touch on really quick here is teleportation. At higher levels, most parties have the capacity to teleport. The actual book version of all the monsters that are part of the Wild Hunt don't include any way for them to teleport. This can become somewhat of a problem. My solution to this though is fairly simple. If the party teleports away, then the Master of the Hunt and his hounds should be able to just meld back into the Feywild, find another door into the Material Plane that then brings them out a little bit closer to where the party is. Now of course it's only fair that by blowing spell slots and teleporting the party should have bought themselves a little bit of time, but by no means does this mean the encounter should be over. The only reason I bring this up is just because it's a good thing to keep in the back of your mind, just having a contingency plan so the players don't totally defeat this encounter just by using one spell. But like I said, I mean they are trying to get away, so rightfully so it should buy them at least half an hour. But Ultimately, the Master of the Hunt is still going to be after them, and if they're under the sky, he can use his moon scrying ability to still see where they are. The other problem you might run into here is plane shifting. I think you have a couple different options, one of which could be to have the Master of the Hunt actually just follow them into another plane, which could kind of create this multiverse spanning chase, which would be kind of neat. However, if you don't want to run that and you just don't find that interesting, you could also always rule that during whatever astral event is going on that the Master of the Hunt comes into the material world, Palinar travel is not possible. This would actually kind of make sense because why would the Master of the Hunt not choose the day where planar travel isn't possible to come into the world and hunt powerful mortals? Ultimately, whatever solution you come up with here is probably going to be fine, it's just something to think about when you're preparing this encounter. So hopefully that'll give you some starting points for running your own adventure. Regarding the creatures themselves though, there are a couple minor changes that I've thought might be kind of interesting. First off, we've got the hounds, which I think are already awesome, but wouldn't it be cool if each one of the four hounds had its own unique ability? Maybe the bite from the green one causes poison or the gaze from the blue one causes some kind of petrification effect or maybe even the red one causes exhaustion when it strikes something like that i think could add a lot of flavor but you also need to be careful because it could be overkill especially against some groups that are lower level i do think it allows for some interesting interaction and ultimately builds up this encounter to be more complex but you still need to be careful to make sure you're not just going to outright kill all your players <laughs> The other thing I wanted to mention is the fact that our big boss man doesn't seem to have a name. It's not that he necessarily has to have a name, but giving him a cool ancient elven sounding name would really make him come alive in the minds of your players. It's one thing to discover a tome detailing the master of the hunt in his yearly excursion, but it just seems so much more interesting to learn about the tale of Zaltarash, Hunter of Legends. Just a suggestion, but I think you'll find if you do that, it will make a difference. Well, that is all for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode because I really enjoyed making it. If you did, please leave a comment below telling me how you plan on using this creature or creatures in your game, or if you've had them used on you by DM in the past. And if you like what I do here and you want to see more, please subscribe to the channel. I have at least one new video every single week. And of course, if you're looking for the monster conversion, you will find the link in the description below, right next to all the Twitter and other stuff. As always, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.